so back when I was sketching out plans for this church year, um, I had this idea that I wanted to have a Sunday early in the church year where we'd celebrate our newest members and celebrate membership in general. There was kind of a lot of excitement, exciting things happening. There was a lot of, of bubbly energy around our membership programs, and, and I thought I wanted to talk about that. So we had this new membership director, Rachel Rose, who's helping us take our welcoming and our sense of welcome to a, to a new level. We have a small but mighty membership committee whose work I really want to encourage because they're doing good work. We had a large exploring membership class in August with members practically having to sit on each other's laps during the class in the Kirby room. And um, we've already had more members, more new members join the church in the first six year, uh, in the first six weeks of this church year than we had all last year. So it's kind of some exciting stuff happening. So I thought I'd preach a sermon about membership. And then I sat down to compose my sermon, and I thought, why did I think this was a good idea? What a, what? <laughs> Isn't membership a boring topic? What a way to kill momentum, Tom. And so this morning, I do want to offer a few words about membership. I want to offer them to our more than two dozen newest members, to our experienced members, our veteran members, and to those who have been coming for months or for years and years but are not members of the church yet. I want to talk to everybody. I thought about this question, why does membership matter? Why does membership matter? Um, and the, the answer that I came to was not a very satisfactory one. The first thing I thought of, well, it's a, it's a way of of demarcating. It's a way of demarcating one group apart from another group. And I thought about our religious ancestors, the Puritans. And since we've got a couple from Worcester here, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd do, some, do some Puritan preaching to you all. <laughs> Didn't get this at the first service. No, I'm kidding. They, they did. It just happens that you're here. Um, in America, Unitarianism descended from the Puritans. They're our religious ancestors. And that's a fact that may sound surprising to a lot of people. Um, and one of the things that really stands out about the Puritans is that they had extremely strict and demanding ideas about church membership. Membership for them was reserved exclusively for the elect, for those whose salvation was assured. In order be to become a member of one of the Puritan churches, you had to meet with the minister and deliver a testimony to show how God had acted in your life and how God had provided you with a sign, a sure sign of your salvation. And then the minister would judge whether or not there was enough evidence that you were among the elect and accept you or reject you from church membership accordingly. Now, it happens that many of these testimonies, by the way, are actually preserved in writing from um, almost 400 years ago. And back as a divinity school student, I had the opportunity to read these spiritual autobiographical narratives. Um, and something happens when we teach an exploring membership class here in the church. One of the exercises that I give to the class is I hand out, I hand out a blank piece of paper and crayons and invite all the members of the class to sort of sketch their, their spiritual journey or their spiritual autobiography. And this is, is done so that the participants can share them with each other, not so that I can sit and judge whether or not you have acceptable evidence of salvation. Um, and so that's, that's, it's interesting that, that the membership process does include, now it does include kind of a recounting of spiritual autobiography, um, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not put in a place to sort of judge whether your story is acceptable or not. For the, for the Puritans, this very rigorous concept of membership actually worked quite well, and it worked because the Puritans who had set sail across the Atlantic had self-selected for the most part. 
You had to be really serious about your religion if you were going to choose to get on a boat and sail across the ocean and make your home among others who were also so serious about their religion that they decided to make such an arduous journey. And so requiring a personal testimony wasn't a lot to ask of people who were willing to give up their homeland and move to a new continent. But then something happened to the Puritans that began to cause problems with these rules about membership. The Puritans had children. Having children changed everything. Isn't that the truth? And as it turns out, religious zeal is not necessarily passed down from one generation to the next. There's no gene that guarantees that if you are very religious, that your children will be also very religious or very religious in the same way. This is kind of obvious if you stop to think about it. How many of you would say that you differ religiously from your parents in a, in a significant... A good, a good portion, a good portion. And if history is any guide, our children don't necessarily, will not necessarily, by virtue of nature or nurture, always hold the same religious views that we do. And so among those Puritans who came over in 1630, within a generation there was a growing population of young people who weren't interested in church membership. They hadn't experienced a profound conversion experience, and this made their parents very nervous. So what their parents did was around the 1660s, was that all of the churches rewrote their rules for membership. Under the new rules, full membership was reserved for those who could give a testimony, and half membership, it was called the halfway covenant, half membership was available to the children of full members. Full members could receive communion and could vote on church business, and half members were allowed to be baptized. Who thinks this sounds like a smart idea? It didn't work out well. At best, it just pushed these issues down the road, and then half members had children, and did they become quarter members? (laughs) And what happened was the system became very, very anxious about who was really in and who was not fully in, who was really in. I share this religious history, our religious history, not to advocate for a different system of membership for us today, but rather... I share it to observe that when we begin to talk about the requirements for membership and standards for membership and expectations of members, these discussions will, among some of us, tend to raise anxiety. Why membership matters may not be the sexiest topic in the world, but it will sometimes evoke strong opinions. So one of the tensions that we observe in church life is wanting it both ways. On one hand, we we want for there to be some rigor. We want membership to challenge us, to really mean something. And on the other hand, we don't want to be exclusive. We don't want to exclude anyone. We want a membership of the elect, except for that we don't. We want for there to be exceptions. So that I think that's an anxiety about membership that we've inherited, at least at least people who do kind of churchy stuff have inherited. There's, there's an anxiety that if there's this kind of high bar to membership, there will be anxiety about whether people are becoming members and whether people are up to the task. And if there's kind of a lower bar to membership, there's anxiety about, you know, who are these people? And are, and are they pulling their weight? Questions like that that are, that are kind of rude questions. Our bylaws, in case you may be wondering... Do not require evidence of your salvation in order for you to become a member. Just want to point that out. But here's what what our bylaws do say. That's interesting. They say, any person may become a voting member of the church who is 16 years of age or older, is in sympathy with the mission, vision, and covenant of the church, has attended an orientation session, has made a recorded financial pledge, and has signed the membership book. And then it gets into um, the, uh, the, the, the what-ifs and the exceptions. It says, those who are under 16 may join with full rights of membership after participating in a coming-of-age program or meeting other requirements for membership. A, membership's na- a member's uh, uh, 
And it says also that in cases where a member is not financially able to make a financial pledge, that pledge may be waived by the minister. And so it begins to say, and then, and then it goes on and says that there shall also be a category called associate, which seems to be proof that our bylaws were written by folks from academia. We've got like associate professor and we've got associate member. Um, and, and associates are defined in our membership as someone who makes a pledge but has not signed the book and doesn't get to vote. So that's what our bylaws say. When I lead an exploring membership class, I tell the people who are contemplating becoming members that there are four Ps of membership. There's presence, participation, pledging, and passing it on. Presence means coming to worship and religious education and church events. Participation means getting involved in service and leadership. Pledging means pledging, and passing it on means sharing the church with others. But then I say, the expectation is presence, but we won't take attendance. We have no means how. We wouldn't even know how to take attendance. Participation, but we actually have no way of mandating that, really. We've got no system to mandate that. Pledging, but our bylaws do allow for a waiver in case of financial hardship. And passing it on, but don't worry, no, we're not going to have you go door to door with pamphlets. And by the way, I should mention with that that I was reading an, an article about membership, and it said this, this said there is data shows, which is an interesting, because I don't know how they got this data, but in, interesting, the article about membership said, data shows that the average UU invites someone to their church once every 26 years. <laughs> which I have no idea how, I have, I have no idea how they got that data, but what's, but what's interesting, and then I, I tell the exploring membership class, I say, so really, it's, it's, not, like, uh, it's not like everybody else is doing that either. <laughs> so, which is, which is interesting. I should say, um, I mentioned before the Small But Mighty Membership Committee um, is actually going to be launching a project in the next week or so. It's a, a project, I, I don't think that any, anything that's been done here before, or maybe not, not done yet during, during my tenure, um, they're going to be making calls to members and associates and inquiring about the first two Ps, not the, not the pledging and not the passing it on. They're going to ask about your presence and your participation. Are you coming? If so, great, and if not, why? And are you participating? Are you making connections? Are you finding places to get involved? Are you finding connections here in the church? If so, great. If not, is there anything that we can do to help you become connected? I'm really glad that they're doing this. Um, so you all, by virtue of being here, you all get to cross off the presence. You get to say, yes, I was, I was there at church. Um, so answer, answer your phone when they call you, please. So I want to ask a question. Should membership, should membership mean fulfillment of a number of considerations as set forth in the bylaws, in our, in our rules? Should it be a higher bar? Or should it be something that is a little bit wishy-washy? There was a story that uh, came out about a year ago about a church in the Houston area. Fortunately, it's um, not a Unitarian Universalist church that this story was about, as you'll, you'll hear in a minute as I tell the story. Fortunately, it's not about a UU church. Um, and, as I, and as I read it, I, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, it's, you, never, you never want to see bad things happen to anybody. So what happened is in this church there had been a, a 92-year-old woman who had been a member of the church for 50 years. For 50 years, or at least that's what that's what her family believed. Um, and she went through a period of illness, uh, significant illness, and, uh, and she died. 
And the family called the church and said, we'd like to plan our mother's funeral. And the uh, minister told the family, I'm sorry, uh, your mother was not a member. Her, her membership lapsed, and I'm not going to do her funeral. And the story, somehow it got elevated into the press. So the, so the family and the minister were communicating each other through the press, which is, which is like a horrible thing. Um, and didn't look good for, certainly didn't, I think, hor- thank, good it was, thank goodness it wasn't a UU church. And so the family's side of it was she'd been a member for some number of decades, and even though her membership technically had lapsed, who would let the membership of an, of an elderly person in a nursing home, who would let their membership lapse? And what is, you know, what's the deal here? funeral. And the minister's take on it was membership needs to mean something and there's, there's, there's rules for it. And I, I have no problem saying that the minister was in the wrong here. I pledge that I will, I will never tell anybody who asks that they can't have their memorial service here. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting question that we say, oh yeah, you know, you know, clearly, there's clearly exceptions. Clearly, that we the rules are made to be bent and broken. I was spending an evening recently with the board of trustees. Um, we were joined by a consultant, and the consultant asked us. He said, "What are the benefits of membership here in this congregation?" Why does membership matter in this church? Why would anybody want to become a member here? He wasn't asking about the benefits of membership. You know, you get a chalice pin when you join, which is is an upgrade. You used to get a rose, and so I don't want anybody resigning their membership and then re-signing up so that they can get a chalice pin. If you want a chalice pin that badly, I'll get you one. Um, You get... You know, members get the UU World magazine through our denomination. Um, you know, but a lot of things are not. There's there's no sort of special benefits to to membership. You know, the minister will do your memorial service, whether you're an official member or not. Members don't get their own special worship services. Memberships don't get members don't get their own special programs. The consultant wasn't asking us about special rights. Do members have the ability to vote or the ability to serve in an elected position? Those are, those are important. And I don't want anybody resigning their membership just so they won't be asked to serve on the board. <laughs> but that consultant was asking the board why someone would want to be a member. Why does membership matter here? And so I was in the room with the members of the board, and one, one board member spoke up and said, I think someone would want to be a member of this church, would want to be a member here, because they want to be connected. They want to be connected to this community. They want to feel connected. They want to know that they're connected. Another board member spoke up and said, I think they want to be counted. I think at the end of the day, someone who's a member here wants to be counted as a part of this community, part of the work that it does, the difference that it makes. I was uh, sharing with Marion Hirsch, our director of religious education, uh, that I was planning to preach on membership. And Marion said to me, um, she said, outside of getting married and having children signing the membership book of this church is the most significant thing I've done as an adult. I asked Marianne if I could share that, and she said yes, and I said, thank you. I I want to say that. And even though that's true for Marianne, I don't expect that that's going to be necessarily true for every single person. That every single person will be among the, you know, the so-called elect We're members because we want to be connected in community. 
We're members because we want to be counted. Counted in the work that this church does. Counted in the difference that it makes. Counted in its role in the community. Proud of who we are. So I say thank you for listening to Boring Membership Sunday. Enjoy our guest musician, David Roth, next week um, as he plays uh, music for us while I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, pick up your phone when the membership committee calls.